Welcome back. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Over in the neighbouring county of Suffolk, Michael Steele and Jackie Street were driving along the A12 towards the Ipswich roundabout in their Toyota RAV4, having left Great Bentley a little earlier in the day. Just up ahead, Peter Corey was driving Jack's Blue Transit van. The trio were on their way to G&T Commercials to see Jack. The call from Nichols had come only a few minutes earlier, but Steele was still taken by surprise when a convoy of unmarked cars suddenly appeared by his side and a man in a uniform gestured at him to pull over. Steele put his foot down. Two of the pursuit cars also accelerated, weaving around the traffic to take up positions just ahead and just to the side of the Toyota. Steele tried to drive his way out of trouble, but was outclassed. Then, the unmarked escort deliberately drove across his path, crashing into him and forcing him to a halt. A man leaped out and ran towards the driver's window. I am DC Chapel from Essex Police and I am arresting you both for suspicion of being concerned in the importation of controlled drugs. Steele stepped out and glanced at the front of his car. Has he fucking damaged my bumper? He said. One of the younger, keener officers stepped forward and put his hand on Steele's shoulder to guide him towards the car that would take him to the station. Steele's ice blue eyes burned a hole right through the youngster's head. Take your fucking hands off me, boy, Steele said. Never one to miss an opportunity, Steele would later lodge an official complaint about his arrest. He claimed the officers responsible had driven in a malicious manner which could have resulted in serious injury or even the death of him and his partner of 25 years. Steele also complained that when Jackie Street was finally released, she was horrified to discover their home had been abused and damaged by the police. Money loaned to the couple from relatives was allegedly taken and Street's vehicle was seized. She has been maliciously penalised by overzealous officers, wrote Steele. She is now unable to perform normal daytime duties. She has no one to turn to. A few feet further down the road, the door of Jack's transit van was opened by DC Sanders, who slapped his palm down on the quivering shoulder of Peter Corey. You're nicked, he said triumphantly. You are under arrest for conspiracy to supply controlled drugs. Corey stepped down to be cautioned and handcuffed and glanced over at Michael Steele and Jackie Street, both surrounded by equal numbers of police officers. He swallowed hard and then spoke. I don't know what you mean, mate. Jack Wombs was at g and Commercials cleaning an engine when Bill Davidson, other customs officers and a few members of the police armed response unit approached him. OK, Jack, said Davidson, put down the power washer. Jack's brow became a mass of furrows. Actually, it's a pressure washer. Then Jack slowly looked around at the hordes of officers and gunmen surrounding him. Fucking hell, Bill. This is a bit heavy, ain't it? As he was driven away in handcuffs, Darren Nichols kept an eye out for a familiar face. Darren Nichols states, They took me down to Chelmsford Police Station. All the way there, and when we arrived, I kept looking out for Jim. I kept expecting him to pop up at any moment and say, No, this one's okay. He's on our side. I was sure this was all down to him, but he'd finally swooped, and the reason I'd been arrested was to stop Mick and Jack from suspecting I'd grasped them up. They let Colin go home after a couple of hours. They realised he had nothing to do with anything illegal, but he wasn't allowed to make any phone calls or see anyone for ages. They interviewed me for the first time just before 11.30pm. They were asking me loads of questions about the cannabis they'd found in my van and where it come from. I was just going, no comment, to the whole lot, no matter what they said. I'd only been selling the drugs because Jim had told me to keep him with Mick. In my mind, at least, I hadn't really done anything wrong. I was sure it was all going to be fine, but then they played their trump card. Essex Police, record of tape recorded interview, Chelmsford Police Station, 13th of the 5th, 96, 23, 26 hours. Detective, 
Constable Winston. We believe that you were in convoy today and you were playing an active part in the transportation of 10 kilos of cannabis resin and you were being asked to make some form of comment about that. Do you wish to say anything about that? No comment. Again, I draw your attention to the fact that if you refuse to answer this question, it may affect any other answers you give at your trial. Do you understand that? No comment. Right. And lastly, there's a record is being made, as I've said, of this tape. And should you later be prosecuted, this will be brought up at your trial. Do you understand that? No comment. Okay, well, if that is it, you've got the notice. I don't intend to say any more about the possession with intent to supply at the moment. The time by my watch is now 23.35 hours. And you're going to be arrested for being involved in the murder of Pat Tate, Craig Rolfe and Tony Tucker. Do you wish to make any comment to the fact you've now been arrested for that murder? No comment. Darren Nichols states, They were doing it to gauge a reaction, and I didn't give one. But as soon as they switched the tape off, I went mad. What do you think you're doing arresting me for that? I said. This was my worst nightmare coming true. And where was Jim? The following day, the evidence against him was starting to mount up. Nichols was beginning to realise how hopeless his situation was. In addition to all the police and customs surveillance records, which now included still pictures and video footage, the police also had access to the phone records of both Nichols and Steele. Again, Nichols took the no comment road, but it was obvious he was being backed into a corner. In fact, with neither Steele or Wombs being caught in possession of drugs, there was more evidence against him than anyone else. And then, once again, just when things were looking at their bleakest, they got even worse. Essex Police, Record of Tape Recorded Interview, Chelmsford Police Station, 14th of the 5th, 96, 15, 51 hours. Just to put it in a nutshell here, Darren, what we're actually saying is that there's been a large importation of cannabis resin to this country. You have now been shown to have been privy immediately before this importation came about by your association with Steele and the others. You have then, subsequently in the very early hours of the next morning, been involved directly in the importation of these drugs. Your vehicle has subsequently been forensically examined and there is salt water and a large amount of sand consistent with this having been used on the beach, consistent with the importation taking place. You have been shown by surveillance to have been involved in the collection of a consignment of 10 kilos of cannabis resin. As far as I'm concerned, you're a large player in all the goings on that have happened. You were so concerned at the time that you were stopped that your first thought was to try and tell Mr Steele that it had all come on top as far as you were concerned. I feel in the light of that summary you should reconsider your situation. I want you to understand the enormity of what we are saying to you. Do you understand that? No comment. Fine. Now, I have a copy of your custody record from last night. This entry is timed at 21.16 hours. It says, quote, Whilst carrying out the review, Mr Nichols asked if he could speak to a nominated police officer known to him. I passed this to Superintendent Story, who declined this, and Nichols was informed of the above. Would you like to make any comment about that? No comment. Would you like to tell me who the police officer was that you wish to have some dialogue with at the time? No comment. Okay. I can tell you that at the moment, two police officers from Essex have been arrested and are currently in custody. Oh, fuck, I don't fucking believe it. The officers have been charged with a number of offences, including some linked to the possession of controlled drugs. We have evidence that you have had numerous dealings with one of the officers. Is there any comment you wish to make now? No. No fucking comment. As soon as the interview was over, Nichols asked to see the most senior officer available. What happened next was recorded by DC Winston in his pocketbook. Quote, I was in the company with Detective Superintendent Barrington when we spoke to Darren Nichols in an interview room. Nichols had signed the custody record to agree to be seen without a solicitor. This meeting had been requested by Mr Nichols, who was introduced to Mr Barrington. Nichols asked Mr Barrington if he named the arrested officer, would he confirm it? Mr Barrington agreed, and Mr Nichols said, Is it DC Jim? Mr Barrington confirmed this, and then he, Nichols, went on to say that this was how he had gotten into trouble, and wanted to say he'd been set up. Mr Barrington explained that regardless of what information Mr Nichols gave, that he would be responsible and have to accept any sentence passed on him by the legal system. Mr Nichols accepted this and asked about what protection would be given to him and his family. 
Mr Barrington said that Mr Nichols must be totally honest in all details given so that an accurate judgment could be made regarding the level of protection offered. Mr Nichols asked about protection in prison and was told about the system of protection that was available for registered informants. Mr Nichols said he would be giving information regarding illegal activities of policemen and said he did not say anything to DC Winston because he did not know if he could trust him. Mr Barrington said that Mr Nichols could trust him fully and that he should tell him the whole truth of what his involvement was. Mr Nichols stated that he was a registered informant of DC Jim and Mr Barrington acknowledged this by stating that he knew all about that and that he had sanctioned a payment to him and that DC Winston had no involvement with DC Jim at all. Mr Nichols said that for the last six months he felt he was being used and that drugs jobs were not his main concern and that other more serious things would be disclosed. Darren Nichols states, I knew I didn't have a choice. I tried to put myself in Jack and Mick's shoes to wonder what was going through their minds and pretty soon I realised I was totally screwed. Two days earlier Jack had threatened to kill me, the next day he gets arrested. In Mick's case I come round to collect some drugs and an hour later he gets arrested. It was a good bet that by now they had also been told about a couple of policemen who had been nicked and I had been talking to one of them. It wouldn't take them long to put two and two together and even if they didn't work out I was giving information about the smuggling side of things I was still the weak link in the murder case. And now the cops were talking about reminding me in custody in Chelmsford Prison. That's exactly where they were going to put Jack and Mick and the others. I wouldn't last five minutes. It was time to start talking. So where do we start in terms of the potential guilt of Michael Steele and Jack Wombs? Firstly, we're going to be starting with a few paragraphs from the police statement given by Donna Jaggers. Now, Donna Jaggers was the long-term girlfriend of Craig Rolfe, the driver of the Range Rover on the evening of December the 6th. The following are paragraphs from the police statement given by Donna Jaggers on the 14th of the 3rd, 1996. I understood that Steele had been asked by a London-based drugs firm to import 30 kilos of Charlie and I believed that he was going to bring it in by plane from Holland. He had told Pat Tate that he was going to be given £50,000 as an upfront payment to take to Holland and he was going to bring the Charlie back in company with a member of the London firm. The idea was that Pat Tate and Tony Tucker would rob the firm of the Charlie when it arrived over here. Steele had stated that he wanted to share it between them and had told the firm that he was going to land near to Clacton. Craig told me that Steele was planning to actually land in South Essex but I never knew exactly where this was likely to be. Craig, Tony and Pat had previously obtained a machine gun from a man called Mad Mick Bowman and the details of this are subject of a previous statement. Tate and Tucker were going to use the gun on the man from the firm in order to take the Charlie. I knew that they had made sure that the gun worked but I did not know how far they were planning to go when they robbed the firm. Steele was going to land the plane and Tate and Tucker were then going to take the complete load. It was going to be split evenly, 10 kilos each, and was going to be taken to John McCarthy. Craig told me that McCarthy was going to pay them nearly £1 million for the load, which was for Tate or Tucker to divide. Not long after Craig had told me about this, he told me that Tate and Tucker had decided that he was going to drive the load away once it had been taken and go to McCarthy's with it. They had told Craig that they intended to rip steel off by cutting 3 kilos of the cocaine into 10 kilos of impure. This would have resulted in Tate and Tucker having 27 kilos between them. The remaining 3 kilos was going to be taken to Mick Bowman and he was going to cut it for them. I do not know what the arrangements were to get the 3 kilos to Bowman or to get the 10 kilos of impure back to steel. By this time I was getting very worried by Craig's involvement and told him that I didn't want him to have any part in it. He told me that Steele didn't know he was going to be driving and he convinced me that he wasn't as heavily involved as the other two in what was going to happen. He also talked about the money which was likely to be coming their way and how that would enable us to go ahead with whatever plans we wanted. I realised I wasn't going to be able to talk him out of it and, albeit I really didn't want him to go through with it, but I gave up in the end. I believe that by this time he was in too deep. Craig told me that the money had been paid to Mickey Steele who had taken it to Holland. The weather had changed and there was now snow on the ground. Craig told me that this was causing them delay and they were waiting for it to clear. On the day of the murder I was working as normal and was due to finish at 3pm. That evening Tony Tucker and his girlfriend Anna 
Craig and I and Pat Tate and a girlfriend named Claire were all going to the Global Net Cafe restaurant in Romford. We were going out because they believed they were coming into money and they were going to have a pre-celebration. Okay, now this is where the story begins. What's important is to remember this part of the statement. Craig told me that the money had been paid to Mickey Steele, who had taken it to Holland. The weather had changed and there was now snow on the ground. Craig told me this was causing them delay and they were waiting for it to clear. Now after reading that paragraph in Donna Jagger's statement just recently, it set off a theory in my own head. Clearly that paragraph states there that they believed that Michael Steele had taken the money across to Holland and was waiting for the weather to clear. So what if Tucker Tate and Rolf genuinely believed on the 6th of December 1995 that Michael Steele was in fact abroad? Does that tie in with the fact that there's no DNA evidence in the Range Rover linking Michael Steele to ever being in that vehicle? The one thing that we need to do at this point before we continue is to try our very best to wipe clear what was being told by Darren Nichols because I think it's been drummed into us in such a heavy way over the years that Michael Steele was in the Range Rover, they met at the Halfway House pub, they travelled down the A127 towards Workhouse Lane, Nichols dropped Jack Wombs off. We need to remember that this is the word of Darren Nichols, someone who has to distance himself absolutely distance himself from any prior knowledge of these murders taking place. So let's continue on at this point with a clear mind, a clean slate if you will. Let's forget about Michael Steele travelling down in the Range Rover, meeting at the halfway house, putting on his overalls, taking off his boots. Let's forget about all of that and look at it from a different perspective. Let's try and look at this from a different angle here. The 2pm phone call. The 2pm phone call on the afternoon of December the 6th 1995 which was supposedly to arrange the meeting for later that evening. This was the beginnings of the lure to kill Tucker, Tate and Rolf. That very location is incredibly intriguing. If you can see in front of you there we have Jack Wombs workplace, G&T commercials, we have the Sorrel Horse pub and the location of the phone box. Now let's say, for instance, that this wasn't actually Michael Steele making this call as it's been rumoured to arrange the meet for later that evening. But this phone call was actually from Jack Wombs to tell Tucker and Tate that Steele was on his way back, the weather had cleared, and they needed to meet down Workhouse Lane later that evening. What also adds a little bit of credibility to this notion is the fact that the phone records show that on the 5th and the 6th of December 1995 there is not one call between Michael Steele and either Tucker, Tate or Rolf. Is this because Steele has put forward the ruse, the idea that he is abroad sourcing this parcel, they're all going to become rich, he's going to fly this parcel over, just like the West Hanningfield drop, which we will get onto in a little while. So what would be the benefit to Michael Steele creating such a story in order to kill Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Well, the first thing which springs to my mind is that it almost removes him slightly from the equation. If they believe that he is abroad, it's the element of surprise. You can forget this notion of Steele travelling down there in the Range Rover. That's not backed up by any DNA or scientific proof whatsoever. That is just literally based on the word of Darren Nichols. So let's say, for instance, that Steele isn't in the Range Rover. He's in fact laying in wait down the lane with Jack Wombs, and it's the element of surprise there. But more importantly, it's the fact that he has told them he is abroad. And this is something which, I don't know, it's always grated on me in this case. The fact that Michael Steele supposedly said, meet me down the lane, we're going to check out this landing strip. And one thing which has always puzzled me is the fact that Tucker Tate and Rolf may well in fact, you know, say to someone, oh, I'm going down to meet Mick Steele. We're going down to look at a landing strip. We're going down, you know, we're going down to uh, look at some place where, where stuff's going to be dropped. I'm going to meet Michael Steele. Surely, if you're going to commit triple murder, this is something that I've, I've said many times in many videos, would you really be that blatant 
as to arrange the meeting with Tucker, Tate and Rolf, or Tucker or Tate knowing that someone's going to be driving them, i.e. Craig Rolf, and that easily one of these three individuals could just say, I'm going to meet Michael Steele. Could it be that Darren Nichols concocted the whole story regarding Michael Steele getting into the Range Rover at the Halfway House pub? We need to remember that Darren Nichols is in fact the only person who admits to being near the scene of the crime at the relevant time. What I find interesting about some of the trial points concerning the defence counsel is the fact that they put forward in court that it wasn't in fact Michael Steele in the Range Rover directing them down Workhouse Lane, it may have in fact have been Darren Nichols. Now where the waters get muddied a little is the talk of a second vehicle. In the trial points set out by the defence, they state the following in their notes. Raymond Wright, statement, 13th of the 12th, 95, confidential witness. The Range Rover this man observes entering Workhouse Lane at 1850 hours on the 6th of the 12th, 95, is clearly not the deceased vehicle, as rear lamp guards are a feature of the vehicle he witnesses. What is significant is that three men of large stature occupy the vehicle. The one in the rear offside seat is wearing a fawn light-coloured top, not overalls. We have a photograph of Nichols and Steele together, exhibit SEP 13, page 172, where Nichols is wearing such a top. Let's now take a look at that statement from Raymond Alfred Wright, dated the 13th of the 12th, 95, where he states the following. I'm the owner of a Ford Escort Estate motor vehicle, index Lima 127, Oscar Juliet November, colour red. On Wednesday the 6th of the 12th, 95, my wife and myself attended a funeral, and as such we left our young son at my mother's house in Pitsy. The funeral we attended was in Rygate, and I had to drop my wife and mother-in-law off in Hornchurch. After this, I carried on to Pitsy, where I picked my son up. The route that I would travel from Pitsy to Tolsunt Darcy includes the A130 from the Saddler's Farm roundabout to the East Hanningfield turn-off. I do not know exactly what time it was that I picked my son up, but I am aware that I arrived home in Tolsunt Darcy about 1920 to 1925 hours that evening. As I was travelling along the A130, I went through the Rettenden Turnpike in the direction of Chelmsford, when you come through the Rettenden village and into a de-restricted road area. The road then goes into a series of bends on a decline on the road. Because I'm a regular user of the road, I'm aware that on these bends there is situated a farm shop and a gun club on the right hand side of the road, and I'm aware that there could be vehicles waiting to turn right. As I entered this decline, I became aware that the vehicles in front of me had slowed down. This would have been around 250 foot earlier than I would have anticipated stopping. I slowly caught up with the vehicles in front, but I had to brake quite heavily in the end because I hadn't anticipated that any vehicle would be turning into the farm. I then stopped in the line of traffic, and I believe I was either two or three cars from the front of the line. I believe I was stationary for approximately 10 seconds, when an oncoming vehicle left a gap for the vehicle that was turning right to cut across the traffic. As it did, I could see that the vehicle was a 4x4 vehicle, and because of the shape of the rear of the vehicle and the grille over the rear lights, my immediate reaction was that it was a Range Rover. I believed that the vehicle was dark in colour, and I think it was possibly green. I don't know why, but I think there was at least three people in the vehicle, and I believe there may have been four. I was aware there was a driver of the vehicle who was in the dark, and the person who was sitting in the rear of the vehicle behind the driver's seat. This person, who I believe to be a man because of his size, appeared to be bigger than the driver. He was wearing a light, fawn-coloured upper garment. As the vehicle started to turn, I got the impression that the person in the back looked over his shoulder in the direction of the Rettenden Turnpike. The vehicle then went into a farm track that I did not know existed. I then continued my journey along the A130, and because I wasn't aware of the farm track, I looked down the track and I could see the rear of the vehicle that had turned into the track. But I do not remember seeing the reflectors of any vehicles in front of it. I then continued my journey home. I believe the time that this incident occurred would have been between 1850 hours and 1900 hours, because it normally takes me around 30 minutes to travel home from there. I don't believe I was more than two cars behind the Range Rover, so when it turned I would have been no more than 30 foot from the vehicle. I had a clear and unobstructed view of the vehicle for a period of approximately two seconds whilst it crossed in front of me. 
Although that area of the road is not lit, there was lighting from vehicles coming from the opposite direction. At the time I saw this, the traffic was quite heavy, especially traffic travelling towards South End. I do wear glasses, but this is not necessary when driving. The man in the fawn-coloured garment in the rear of the vehicle appeared to be sat tight against the window and was even leaning with his right shoulder against the window. Now one thing I believe is imperative to remember, regardless of which side of the fence you currently sit, in terms of Michael Steele's innocence or guilt, one thing which is imperative to remember is that Darren Nichols wasn't so concerned in terms of securing a conviction against Wombs and Steele, his main concern was always saving his own skin. So the fact that Darren Nichols may well have lied in places, the fact that his statement probably doesn't make much sense in a lot of places, does not necessarily mean that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs are innocent of the crime. Darren Nichols' first port of call always was self-preservation, regardless of what his version of events states. And it's really important that we remember that. It's the case that he has to distance himself from any prior knowledge of these murders. But could it have been Nichols who was in a Range Rover, directing possibly Tucker Tate and Rolf or other individuals down Workhouse Lane? That's entirely possible. After all, it is Nichols who actually admits to being in Rettenden on the evening of December the 6th, or at least very close to the crime scene itself. Before we continue on with this video, let's just refresh our memories in terms of what was stated in Donna Jagger's statement. Craig told me that the money had been paid to Mickey Steele, who had taken it to Holland. The weather had changed and there was now snow on the ground. Craig told me this was causing them delay and they were waiting for it to clear. Now what we know in terms of other witness statements from people close to Tucker, Tate and Rolf is that there is no doubt that these individuals believed that they were quickly and soon to be coming into money. Now this is best demonstrated by Pat Tate's relationship with Barry Dorman. He sees his friend, his long-term friend Barry Dorman, the car salesman, on the 6th of December where there is discussion about a vehicle that Pat Tate is going to buy for Sarah Saunders. There's a falling out between Saunders and Tate, so Tate no longer needs the vehicle. But because he is soon to be stinking rich or coming into certainly a great deal of cash, he decides he's going to buy the vehicle anyway because of the hassle that he's caused his friend Barry Dorman. This is stated in Barry Dorman's own statement from his discussions with Pat Tate on the 6th of December. Tate was coming into money, so he would buy the car anyway. So how did Michael Steele come up with this law? How did he come up with the idea of luring Tucker, Tate and Rolf down Workhouse Lane with the idea of an incoming plane drop? He has stated to them that he's off to Holland. As far as they are aware, he's in Holland. He's bringing his stuff over in a light aircraft. The last person they expect to see down the lane on the evening of December the 6th is Michael Steele, particularly with his two feet firmly on the ground. I believe that the idea could have come from the drop which happened in November 1995 just down the road in West Hanningfield. We will remember the following newspaper article from the 3rd of November 1995 with the title £500,000 worth of drugs dropped from aircraft. Police believe that bungling drug dealers could have dropped more than £500,000 worth of cannabis in a farmer's pond from an aircraft by mistake. The tightly packed cannabis in black plastic packets was fished from the water in West Hanningfield by Essex police divers. Four packets had originally been spotted by farmer Jens Halstrup near the edge of the pond. Sergeant Nigel Dermott, who led the diving operation, said, I have never seen anything like it. The haul is believed to be the biggest of its type in Essex. Police forensic scientists are drying out some of the 53 packets to try to discover its source. The haul weighed more than 300 weight. Detective Chief Inspector Brian Storey, head of Chelmsford CID, praised Mr Halstrup for quickly alerting police. He said it was possible that the cannabis had been dropped from an aircraft. Now what interests me about this story in particular 
Is number one the close proximity between West Hanningfield and Rettendon where Tucker, Tate and Rolf were murdered? Number two, the fact that this newspaper article, this story, came out and hit the press around a month before these three individuals were killed. And thirdly, the fact that Wombs and Steele had almost been caught bringing in the dud cannabis via boat. So what better excuse, what better story to tell Tucker and Tate that the you know, future consignments would be coming in via plane as they had almost been caught? There's evidence that this has worked, this has been done before, or at least someone has tried it before. And what do we find beyond the locked five bar gate where Tucker, Tate and Rolf are found in the Range Rover? What is found beyond the locked five bar gate but large fishing ponds? Could this also tie in with the fact that Tucker, Tate and Rolf were most likely unarmed on the evening of December the 6th? Could it have been that they were simply heading down Workhouse Lane to retrieve a parcel being dropped from a light aircraft being flown simply by Michael Steele? There never was this gang that was supposed to be with Steele. No one was going to be tied up. There was going to be no need for guns to be drawn, for anyone to be tied up and the Charlie to be driven off at high speed in a Range Rover. It was simply a case of heading down to Workhouse Lane, waiting for the parcel to be dropped and collecting it. Or maybe they were even at Workhouse Lane to find a suitable place to drop that parcel. Is that what the call at 2pm was regarding? Was that from Jack Wombs either saying that Steele was on his way over in the aircraft and to be down Workhouse Lane at a certain time to collect the parcel? Or had he had a call from Steele to say that the weather had now cleared, the flight was going to be imminent and they needed to find somewhere to drop this parcel? The following is a small section of the police interview conducted with Sarah Saunders. The interviewing officer here is DC Norton and he is quizzing Sarah Saunders regarding Pat Tate's threats against Michael Steele. DC Norton asks her, what did he actually say about what he was going to do to Michael Steele? Saunders replies, he didn't say what he was going to do, he just laughed and said he would not be coming back. And what did you take that to mean Sarah? Well that something would happen to Mick. That something would happen? Yeah. And what would that be? Well, I don't know, I just just knew that something would happen to him and he wouldn't come back. Meaning that he would be killed? Yeah. How soon after did you meet Michael to tell him? I phoned him up, I think, that afternoon and told him afterwards. I went and met him. Where did you meet him? At the A12. I think there's a McDonald's up there near Chelmsford. I phoned him up on his mobile and asked him to meet me. Now, when taking a look at that small section of Sarah Saunders' police interview there, it's not so much what's being said in the broader sense. It's not so much the fact that Tate has turned up at Saunders' house and told her, you know, sort of laughing and said, you know, Michael Steele's going to be going up north and he won't be coming back. She said, well, but, you know, he's your friend, you know. She was obviously very concerned by what Pat Tate said to her. I think it was in her kitchen when Tate said this to her, that Steele would be going up north, he wouldn't be coming back. Basically a sort of a veiled threat against Michael Steele. But it's not really that's capturing my imagination. It's the fact that she mentions here that she called Michael Steele and they agreed to meet on the A12 in a McDonald's car park. I think at this point in time that Tate was a complete loose cannon. Certainly towards the back end of 1995, I would say the best way that you could describe Tate according to the statements, the newspaper articles and everything else that I've read on this man, the best words to describe him would be volatile. We had the pizza parlour incident where he beat up the manager there. We've had, we've heard numerous beatings or numerous accounts of him throwing his weight around, particularly or even against Sarah Saunders, his on and off girlfriend at the time, chucking her out of her house, chucking her clothes out of the door, screaming and shouting, ranting and raving was commonplace. Clearly at this point in time, even Michael Steele, even Michael Steele wasn't particularly safe from Pat Tate's wrath. What would be the need to arrange a meeting just off the A12 at McDonald's if Pat Tate was this, I guess, sane or reasonable individual? Now, the way that it was portrayed in court, at least by the defence, was that the relationship between these four people, Pat Tate, Sarah Saunders, Michael Steele and Jackie Street, 
the way that their relationship was portrayed, at least by the defence counsel, was that of a relatively normal relationship. Two couples who got on fairly well, who went out together sometimes or socialised together. Um, you know, Michael Steele helped Sarah Saunders move out, had um, control of Tate's finances whilst he was in prison and helped her with money from time to time on Tate's behalf. Um, but is that really the case? Is that really the case? Clearly we know there was great friction between Sarah Saunders and Pat Tate. But what we've always been told, at least from, as I say, the defence's point of view, was that the relationship between Steele and Tate was that of a good one. Even the fact that he had helped Saunders move house, he had been fairly close to Sarah Saunders, him and Jackie Street, that didn't seem to pose too much of an issue. So what exactly was this need? to meet on the A12. Why not simply pop to her house? Why didn't she pop to his house? It's almost like they're trying to meet in secret, not in a romantic sense. I don't want to, you know, don't get it twisted when I say that. Not in a romantic sense, but in the in the in the fact that they're almost worried that they may be seen by Tate, that Tate might turn up and still will be there and it will cause this friction or this issue. It's almost like she wants to tell him this information somewhere out the way where Tate couldn't possibly be, or the likelihood of Tate showing up would be minimal. Now, I'm not for one moment saying that this veiled threat would be enough to instigate triple murder or be enough motive for a triple murder, and I guess I never really have bought into that idea. It's something that's portrayed in a lot of books, a lot of the documentaries and, you know, films regarding the case that Michael Steele was afraid for his life, that Sarah Saunders told him that Tate was going to kill him, yet Steele then got in the Range Rover. I've never really bought into any of that personally. But what I do think this shows is that the relationship between these individuals, at least Saunders, Steele and Tate um, as, a, as a triplet, I was going to say a threesome, but that just sounds terrible, as a triplet wasn't, you know, wasn't as easy going, wasn't as on good terms as it was portrayed in court. Now, interestingly, when we move on in the police interview with Sarah Saunders, the topic of Pat Tate's brother Russell is raised, and it's in this part of the interview that DC Norton asks the following. What does Russell feel about all this, about Mickey Steele? Saunders replies, well, I haven't spoken to him. He's written to me. I haven't spoken to him yet. I was going to see him to see what he thinks because he said to tell Sarah to stop being so naive to Debbie, his wife, and to give me a message. Naive? Yeah. About what, Sarah? Well, about all this, because, you know, I just said to Debbie, Russell's wife, that, you know, Mick's not capable of doing that. And Russell said to Debbie, tell Sarah to stop being so naive. So interestingly there, there does appear to have been some communication between Russell Tate and his wife Debbie and Sarah Saunders and Russell Tate has basically said to Sarah Saunders or to pass on a message to Sarah Saunders saying tell Sarah to stop being so naive. Now obviously we can't speak for um, Pat Tate's brother in this day and age but back when these interviews took place it's clear there that Russell Tate was telling Sarah to stop being so naive regarding her opinion of Michael Steele and his capability. Now, I can only speak for myself when I say this, but reading that, it would appear that Russell Tate was blaming Michael Steele for Pat Tate's death. It, to me, that's quite clear, or at least he's saying there, stop being so naive, Sarah. You don't know what he's capable of. You don't really know the real Michael Steele, as it were. So to me, it looks to me there, at least when I read that, that Russell Tate believed, at that point in time at least, that Michael Steele was potentially guilty of the murders. So then that brings us on to the relationship between Michael Steele and Pat Tate's brother Russell. Now this in itself is actually a very contentious issue for a lot of people who are interested in this case and viewers of this channel. The very relationship between Russell Tate and Michael Steele after the death of Pat Tate. Would someone really do that? Would someone who had killed someone then involve themselves in more illegal activity but with the brother of that man that they had killed. Would someone really do that? Well, what I'd ask you to do is to step back from, I guess, the morals of that. Step back from that for one moment and just look at the potential benefits to Michael Steele if he did, in fact, have something to do with this triple murder. What could the benefits be of aligning yourself with Russell Tate? 
Now, when I think about this from a logical perspective, the only real thing that comes into my mind in terms of Michael Steele aligning himself alongside Russell Tate for future illegal activity would be the fact that Michael Steele would have an ear on the ground in terms of the progress of the case. Could it be that he actually pallied up or buddied up with Russell Tate in order to try and get some information on how the police investigation was going? Were there any suspects? Were there any leads? Were there any potential people out there who they believed were responsible for the deaths of Tucker Tate and Rolf? Really, that's the main benefit that I could see in terms of Michael Steele aligning himself with Russell Tate. The fact that, as I say, he could potentially gain some information that wasn't out there in the press regarding how this investigation was going and what direction, most importantly, this investigation was going. Now, when you look at this from Steele's perspective for one moment, what better way to gain some potential sensitive information or to find out exactly what direction this case is going, where the investigation is heading, what better way to try and gain that information than by befriending a member of their very own family, the family of Pat Tate, working alongside them, conducting illegal activity with them. Was that the reason that Steele decided to work with Russell Tate after these murders. Now, moving away from that topic just for one moment to talk about the planning process again for this triple murder and the actual location which was chosen as in Workhouse Lane, Rettenden, to me, that was incredibly important and also very well thought out. Now, it's my own personal opinion that this murder had to be committed on a Wednesday it had to be shortly after 6.30 p.m., regardless of the surrounding weather conditions. The reasons for that are as follows. Number one, there was a popular gun club situated just a couple of hundred yards from where this crime was committed. It was a shooting club. They used shotguns there, so the actual sound of shotgun fire on a Wednesday evening would be commonplace. Now, the most important thing to remember there is that they only shot there at White House Farm on a Wednesday. On a Wednesday up to around 6, 6.30, gunshots were commonplace. They even had lighting to allow them to shoot after dark. So this very location, the bottom of Workhouse Lane near White House Farm, this location was chosen for that very specific purpose, for the fact that these gunshot blasts would blend in with the normal surroundings of a Wednesday evening. Now, for me, on a personal level, if Michael Steele does have some hand in these murders, then this is how it all relates to the statement of Donna Jaggers. We will remember once again, and we will reiterate once again, that in Donna Jaggers' statement, it states the following. Craig told me that the money had been paid to Mickey Steele, who had taken it to Holland. The weather had changed, and there was now snow on the ground. Craig told me this was causing them delay and they were waiting for it to clear. Now, the vision that I have in my mind, as I say, basing this on the guilt of Michael Steele and Jack Holmes, the vision I have in my mind is of Steele getting a message across somehow, either via Nichols or via Jack Holmes to Tucker, Tate and Rolf, that the weather has cleared. They're now going to be flying the plane over. They're going to be dropping the parcel and to be down Workhouse Lane after 6.30. And for me, that explains the reason why they are unarmed. They trust Michael Steele. They trust this plane that's coming over. They trust the parcel. And they know it's been done before, or at least attempted before, by the drop which was carried out just a few miles away in West Hanningfield a month earlier. To summarise this particular part in the series, I just don't believe that the relationship between Saunders, Steele and Tate was as rosy as put forward by the defence in court. I certainly believe that the actual location which was chosen for the murders is particularly key. Hence the reason I don't really buy into this theory regarding Billy Jasper. I think that this was the whole reason why Workhouse Lane was chosen because it blended in so well with the common surroundings of that area and the, the comings and goings of Workhouse Farm and the shooting club. I believe that is key to why this location, location was chosen. And then once again, back to the statement of Donna Jaggers. To me, this tells me that if they are in fact guilty or played some part in the murders, that this was the very law. There was no robbing of a firm or guns to be taken down there to hold up someone. This was a deal between Steele potentially 
and these three individuals. This was the simple flying over of an aircraft, dropping a parcel, retrieving that parcel, stashing it away somewhere and making your way off to your meal for six people, which was booked for later that evening in Romford. Now, really, the only place to start in terms of the motive for murder and the guilt of Michael Steele and Jack Wombs is the statement which was given by Donna Jaggers. Donna Jaggers being the long-term girlfriend of Craig Rolfe, the driver of the Range Rover on the evening of December the 6th. The following is a section of the police statement given by Donna Jaggers on the 14th of March 1996. The last deal which Steele carried out for them was approximately two weeks after Pat Tate was released from prison, which was at the end of the 10th, 95. Craig told me that Mickey Steele was arranging to bring in £60,000 worth of cannabis from abroad. Craig put in £7,000, Tucker put in £20,000, and Tate and a fourth person called Barry Dorman were putting in the remainder of the money. A couple of days before the cannabis was collected, I went with Craig to Tucker's home address in Fobbing, Essex to hand him the £7,000, which was in a Tesco's carrier bag. The money was handed to Tucker, who was going to hand it to Steele. We were only at the house for about five minutes, and as Craig and I were leaving and walking down the driveway towards our car, I saw Mickey Steele walking up the driveway towards the house. He passed by us and nodded to Craig. He did not speak or acknowledge myself. Steele had come from a white car which I believe he had been driving. I cannot say what the car was, but it was clean and had the appearance of an average family saloon. There was a second male in the car who had short dark hair and appeared to be a little bit younger than Steele. He appeared clean shaven, but I did not take any further notice. We got into our vehicle, which I believe was a Vauxhall Frontera, which had been loaned to Tate by Barry Dorman and left. A couple of days later, Craig told me that Steele had been arrested by customs officers whilst he was taking his boat from the water. This was following him dropping the cannabis off at a safe point on the coastline about three miles away. That same day, Tate was arrested during the early afternoon, having crashed Tucker's Porsche car in South End. I was at work and would have finished at 1500 hours that day. Craig picked me up from work and told me what had happened to Steele. About 1600 hours, Tucker phoned Craig on his mobile phone and told him about his car and what Tate had done to it. At about 1800 hours that day, Craig and I drove to South End Police Station to collect Tate. Once in the vehicle, I became aware that Tate already knew about Steele being arrested. He then used Craig's mobile phone to ring Jackie Street. He asked her if everything was safe. I took it that it was as a result of Tate's manner and subsequently what he said to Craig. He said that it was all safe. I took this to mean that the drugs had not been found. On this occasion, I did not know where the meeting between Steele and the others was to take place, but after a couple of days, Craig bought his share of the cannabis round to our house in Chafford 100. Because the cannabis had already been sold on, the same day, Craig and I took it up to the Golders Green area of North London, where Craig handed it onto a black male called Gary. No money was exchanged because the cannabis was what was known as laid on for Gary to sell and then pay Craig. The agreed amount per kilo worked out to be approximately £10,000 for the lot. Already the others had placed their own share with other dealers, but very quickly they started receiving phone calls telling them that the cannabis was very poor quality. I learned through Craig that Tate and Tucker were very agitated because Steele during this time was trying to push the price that he wanted up. In effect, this was eating into their personal profit from the deal. They contacted Steele and told him they wanted their money back because the cannabis was rubbish. Steele didn't want to take it back. Tate and Tucker then started putting real pressure on Steele to recover the money. By pressure, I mean through intimidation. I cannot say exactly what they did because I do not know, but I recall hearing conversations they had with Steele on the phone where they were ranting and raving at one another and pacing up and down. I understand that Steele finally agreed to return the cannabis and get their money back for them. Tate, in a fit of temper about the whole affair, smashed each slab before it was returned. Steele told them a parcel the same size had been picked up by mistake and that's how the problem had come about. I'm not certain, but I think that on this occasion Steele had to collect the cannabis from Tucker's home address in order to return it. Steele arranged to hand the money back to them on the continent. He was going to return the goods to his suppliers and then take the money to a pre-arranged location where he was to meet Craig, Tucker and Tate. 
The day they were going to meet coincided with Tony Tucker's birthday, which was on the 17th of the 11th. His girlfriend Anna had pre-booked a surprise night in a London hotel prior to the trip to collect the money being made. Therefore, Tony was not going to go. They wanted a group of people to go over in order that the money could be divided up to bring back into this country. Craig asked me to go, but I refused because I was not happy about getting involved and didn't want to go. The eventual party consisted of Barry Dorman and his wife who went in their own car, Pat Tate and Craig with three girls, Donna Garwood, Liz Fletcher and Gaynor Hazer. They travelled in the Range Rover and left via Harwich. Craig did tell me where they went to, but I cannot remember the location or where they stayed. I know that they stayed overnight in a hotel and were met by Mickey Steele. I was told that he met Tate and they went into a separate room. They returned the next day with the money. Whilst all this was going on, I was told that Steele was promising Tate that they had a big job lined up for him. Craig told me that Steele had approached Tate and asked him to nick someone else's gear from them. I understood that Steele had been asked by a London-based drugs firm to import 30 kilos of Charlie, and I believed that he was going to bring it in by plane from Holland. He had told Pat Tate that he was going to be given £50,000 as an upfront payment to take to Holland, and he was going to bring the Charlie back in company with a member of the London firm. The idea was that Pat Tate and Tony Tucker would rob the firm of the Charlie when it arrived over here. Steele had stated that he wanted to share it between them and had told the firm that he was going to land near Clacton. Craig told me that Steele was planning to actually land in South Essex, but I never knew exactly where this was likely to be. Craig, Tony and Pat had previously obtained a machine gun from a man called Mad Mick Bowman and the details of this are subject of a previous statement. Tate and Tucker were going to use the gun on the man from the firm in order to take the Charlie. I knew that they had made sure the gun worked, but I did not know how far they were planning to go when they robbed the firm. Steele was going to land the plane, and Tate and Tucker were then going to take the complete load. It was going to be split, eventually 10 kilos each, and was going to be taken to John McCarthy. Craig told me that McCarthy was going to pay them nearly £1 million for the load, which was for Tate or Tucker to divide. Not long after Craig had told me about this, he told me that Tate and Tucker had decided that he was going to drive the load away once it had been taken and go to McCarthy's with it. They had told Craig that they intended to rip Steele off by cutting 3 kilos of the cocaine into 10 kilos of impure. This would have resulted in Tate and Tucker having 27 kilos between them. The remaining 3 kilos was going to be taken to Mick Bowman and he was going to cut it for them. I do not know what the arrangements were to get the 3 kilos to Bowman or to get the 10 kilos of Impure back to Steel. By this time I was getting very worried by Craig's involvement and told him that I didn't want him to have any part in it. He told me that Steel didn't know that he was going to be driving and he convinced me that he wasn't as heavily involved as the other two in what was going to happen. Now this, the prosecution alleged in court, was the main motive for the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolfe. From these individuals' perspectives, I guess they thought that this was plain sailing. Steele had found a way in with the drugs. They were going to continue to do this until they were all millionaires. What could possibly go wrong? Well, Darren Nichols really went wrong. He went over to Holland, acted like a bit of a prat, and the Dutch dealers most likely tried to rip them off. This, in turn, set off a chain of events which may have led to the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. But was this really the catalyst behind these murders. What we can say with a fair deal of certainty is that once this cannabis arrived over in the UK, trouble started almost immediately. The cannabis was being returned, it was rubbish, it was no good. Well, are you trying to rip me off by selling this? You know, people were upset, dealers were upset. They were calling up Tucker Tate and Rolf saying that the stuff was no good, they wanted their money back. Were Tucker Tate and Rolf trying to pull the wool over their eyes? It caused a great deal of upset in those circles, I would imagine. And particularly for one individual in Pat Tate, the fact that he hadn't actually used his money. He'd, came up, he'd come out of prison, you know, this deal was going down, still put this deal to him, you know, we can bring this money in, this is easy, this is easy work, it's no problem, just get the money, we'll go over, you know, you're about to make a great profit from this. Tate has obviously put this to his backers, he's infused, he's energetic, he wants this deal to go through, this is the start of his career outside of prison. And now he's left with a load of dud gear and money which he has promised to these investors which he can't actually pay. 
Now, if we were talking about three level-headed individuals here, it may not have led to the catastrophic events which followed. But we're talking about Tucker, Tate and Rolf here, and particularly Patrick Tate, a very heavy drug user. Steroids, cocaine, heroin, the lot, basically. But not only that, but how it affected his personality. Tate become incredibly volatile towards the end of 1995. So what would have happened around this time period? Tate is getting pressured because he's borrowed a great deal of money. Not only can he not pay the money back, but he can't give the investors the profit that he had once promised them. Now, this money was in fact paid back. This money was in fact paid back on the continent. Tate got the money back. But what exactly did he do with that money? Did those backers ever get their money back? Or did Tate think to himself, actually, I'm going to keep this money and I'm going to say that I haven't been repaid? Maybe that's because he had spent some of the money on drugs or something else, whatever, and he didn't have the full amount. So he thought he'd buy it himself some time, he'd give himself a few days, a few weeks, he'll come up with some sort of story to say that Michael Steele hadn't repaid the full amount or repaid him at all. Did that then get back to Steele? If Steele and Wombs do have some hand in the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf, and that is a big if, I'm still not convinced that they acted alone. Is it beyond the realms of possibility that an outside firm approached Steele knowing that he was the way into their social circle in order to lure Tucker Tatum Rolf to a particular destination? I just don't believe that there's enough motive even with the falling out regarding the Dud Cannabis deal to create enough motive for these triple murders in terms of Michael Steele. We also have the situation concerning Leah Betts and also in the book Blogs 19, it's mentioned there by Darren Nichols that Mick had found out that Pat Tate was a police informer. He was a snitch and that was one of the reasons why he had to be taken care of. The way I've always looked at it in my own mind is the fact that if these individuals are in fact responsible or played some part in the deaths of Tucker Tate and Rolf, then it was almost a perfect storm of events which led up to the deaths of these individuals. We had the Dud Cannabis deal, the biggest shipment of Steele's career. We had the unpredictable behaviour of Tucker, Tate and Rolf, who had lost face with their investors and were out quite a considerable amount of money. We also had the death of Leah Betts and the media storm which ensued after that event. And also we had Michael Steele mentioning, as I just said there, that Pat Tate was a potential police informant. Not to forget the threat against Michael Steele's life by Pat Tate, which was told to him by Pat Tate's then on and off girlfriend, Sarah Saunders. Is the culmination of those very events, the cannabis deal, the situation with Leah Betts' death, the potential of Tate being a potential police informant, the threat to Michael Steele's life, was it the perfect storm which created the necessity, most importantly, the necessity for Michael Steele to take action? Or are we looking at a mystery third party being involved here? It wasn't so much that Steele and Wombs pulled the trigger on the evening of December the 6th, but they lured Tucker Tate and Rolf down the lane knowing exactly who or what was waiting for them. One thing worth remembering which I have mentioned in previous episodes is that we talk a lot, we surmise, we discuss, we theorise, mainly based on the story told by Darren Nichols. I've even seen videos myself from some other creators who talk about Jack Wombs and Michael Steele must have been here, they must have been in the area of Rettendon. And that just simply isn't the case. If you actually really understand the telephone evidence, the actual version of events could be completely and wholeheartedly different to what we've been led to believe. The simple truth of the matter regarding the Essex Boys case is that we don't know if Michael Steele was ever in the Range Rover. We don't know if that Range Rover ever went to the Halfway House pub. We don't know if Michael Steele and Jack Wombs then headed to the Hungry Horse pub to get changed after the murders. We can't say with any certainty at all that Jack Wombs was scoping out the crime scene the day before these murders were committed. We need to remember, it's imperative to remember to anyone who is interested in this case, that the telephone evidence back in 1995 was approximate. So when they look at where people were, it's not like today where everything's, you know, pinpointed to within a couple of feet of their, you know, their actual location. 
back in 1995, it was a lot more vague. The phone evidence, the phone logs, the phone calls, whichever you want to call them, are and always will be circumstantial, unless someone voluntarily puts themselves near the scene of the crime, i.e. Jack Wombs with the Wheat Sheaf pub car park story. So it's up to you which you believe. Do you believe Darren Nichols' version of events in its entirety? Do you believe some of his testimony, that there's some part truths to what he says? Whichever you believe, the fact of the matter is there is no actual proof regarding the telephone calls. It wasn't as easy and never has been as easy as saying Michael Steele, Jack Wombs, Tony Tucker, Craig Rolfe and Pat Tate were at the Halfway House pub at X time. That is all based on the word of Darren Nichols. It was never backed up and never has been backed up in court with the telephone evidence. As I've said many times before, it's approximate. What I mean by that is when you made a call back in 1995, it would ping off the nearest beacon. And that beacon would service an area of 10 to 15 square miles. So to say categorically that they were definitely at the halfway house, they definitely traveled to this location. Jack Wombs was definitely looking down the lane on the 5th of December scoping out the crime scene is simply wrong. That just is not right. That's based on the technicalities, the technical data, which does not show exact locations. As I say, it's a 15, 10 to 15 square mile radius that he could have been in. Yes, of course, Jack Wombs could be in Rettendon. Of course he could. But he could also be in any other place within a 10 to 15 square mile radius of that beacon. It doesn't prove anything. So where does that actually leave us? It leaves us with a great deal of scope in terms of the actual truth regarding the Essex boys case. We base and we look at this story from the very beginning through the eyes of Darren Nichols on far too many occasions. That isn't anyone's fault. It's just a story that's being told so often that it's almost become ingrained into our minds. The fact is we don't know. We don't know. We don't know where these individuals were at certain times. It's all assumption. It's all based on the word of Darren Nichols. If you believe Darren Nichols, then that's fine. That's what you believe. But there's no actual factual proof. There's no factual proof, never has been factual proof that certain people were in certain places at certain times as it's being portrayed in many documentaries, films and books. That just simply is not the case. So let me know in the comment section below your own thoughts and theories regarding the Essex boys case. Do you believe Darren Nichols is telling the whole truth, part truth or simply a pack of lies? Do you believe, as discussed earlier on in this video, that there was enough motive for Michael Steele to bloody his hands in terms of killing Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Or was there or could there be a mystery party involved somewhere down the chain? Was it the fact that Michael Steele was simply paid to get these individuals to the bottom of Workhouse Lane on the evening of December the 6th? 